Hello and welcome back to another edition of Press Pass on GNI TV. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director of GNI TV's news project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, April 22nd. Also, a great pleasure today be, to be joined by Calvin Cutler, who uh, covers the State House and politics for WCAX and is also a frequent panelist on Vermont This Week at Vermont Public. Calvin, welcome to GNI. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. This is great. I, I've been looking forward to this show for a while now. Uh, uh, and I greatly appreciate you making the time for this conversation during a very busy stretch up at the State House. Uh, it's actually been a pretty busy year uh, right on through, and we're kind of getting, I guess the finish line is sort of becoming visible uh, a few more weeks at least uh, before uh, uh, the State House would typically adjourn. Uh, but it seems like there's a lot of unfinished business still uh, still to be worked out. And I, I guess I wondered if you could maybe talk us through some of it. Uh, you know, two of the big issues that uh, I've captured my attention down here have been the whole housing slash Act 250 question and also educational finance. And uh, so I thought we could start there. Uh, maybe let's begin with the housing uh, Act 250 piece. Uh, as I understand it, the, there have been a couple of bills uh, dealing with uh, trying to incentivize new housing development and also to uh, update Act 250, a 50 year old plus bill I remember when I got passed, I was in college at the time, and that was a very long time ago. So uh, uh, I guess it's due for a bit of an overhaul. Uh, but uh, there seems to have been a lot of uh, back and forth between the governor and some of the legislative leaders around us. So where do we stand on that at the moment? Yeah, certainly. And thank, thank you very much. I mean, you know, this has been certainly one of the biggest topics of the legislative session. You know, going into it, everybody knew that housing was going to be key, uh, especially after the flooding that we saw that took a huge chunk of our, our housing stock offline, especially in central Vermont. And so the House has passed a bill and now the Senate is working on a bill essentially which would co come up with new tiered jurisdictions for Act 50. So tier 1A in your heaviest, uh, densest downtowns like Burlington or Winooski or, or, or Bennington, um, where there'd be fewer Act 250 exemptions, and then going all the way to tier 2, tier 3, which would try to provide more protections for natural resources like headwaters, streams, um, dense forests and wetlands, things that are, are designed and are intended to protect Vermont from, from climate change and its effects. So really, this is a, a um, land use bill with a little bit of, you know, biodiversity protection baked into it as well. That's sort of the, the balance that the legislature has been trying to strike. But in recent weeks, or really this whole session, but really in recent weeks, we've heard, um, you know, Governor Phil Scott raise increased concerns about it, saying that it really doesn't do enough to invest in our housing stock and to incentivize housing as well. You know, he worries that in some rural communities that won't have exemptions or places where Act 250 really won't change at all, he's worried about those communities being left behind. So even as recent as last week, you know, he said that he will not accept a, a bill that, that doesn't have more exemptions or more um, more more loosening, if you will, of Act 250 in some of these these rural uh, rural towns. But but certainly, I think you know we are heading. You know, the House and Senate they are working out their differences. Whether they'll um, the the uh, meet the approval of of Governor Phil Scott, I think that that still remains to be seen. This was an issue uh, last session, and really, it it is sort of a, a perennial issue at this point. Of you know, can comprehensive act 250 form get a uh, reform get across the finish line um some are, are hoping that this is the year but again we'll we'll have to see it's it's going to be a, one of those really dynamic issues uh up until the last few minutes really of the session so right now uh as i understand there's uh, two or three bills have sort of merged together and they're they're in the senate right now where one of the senate committees uh is still has to go before the full senate um so if if, if they sort of uh, give a thumbs up to that, uh, then, then what, it goes back to the House for uh, a little more tweaking or a compromise working out or a conference committee? Exactly. Yeah. So there's uh, H687 is the, the bill, the, the vehicle that they've been using to uh, put, you know, all of these these changes to Act 250 on. There's another bill, S311, which is the Be Home Act, um, uh, sponsored by Chittenden County Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale. This was the one that actually the governor really liked, and it had a lot of tax incentives and things like that. 
But what the their the Senate Natural Resources Committee is, is doing is they're taking pieces of that bill and attaching it to that that housing that Act 250 bill, and then they're going to advance that. You're right; it will uh, go back to the House. They'll have to work out their differences in conference committee. But I I don't expect too many changes. You know, whatever whatever ultimately comes out of of uh, the Senate, I think the House will mostly um, agree with. There's been a lot of coordination between those those two committees. And again, this all came out of a working group um, that worked uh, really the past summer, um, made up of of environmentalists, conservationists, uh, housing developers, lawmakers, and others. And so they they say that there is a broad agreement with this. Um, but again, I think you know, will it uh, will, will it you know meet what the governor is looking for? Uh, I think that that still remains to be seen. Uh, he even, as I said, threatened to veto it at least as of last week. So we'll uh, we'll have to see. Well, what exactly is he looking for beyond what they've had in the bill? I mean, uh, uh, more money to be invested in, in incentivizing developers to build more housing? Is that, is that essentially what he, what he wants? Well, not, not necessarily more money, right? You know, there are a few other proposals that we can get into later that do, um, you know, earmark money for affordable housing. But the governor really wants systemic change made to Act 250. Um, at, you know, there was a lot of work that was done last year with uh, zoning uh, and local zoning, duplexing by right as part of the Home Act. But the governor would like to see, you know, exemptions for Act 250 statewide, um, you know, loosening of it, not necessarily this tiered. Uh, jurisdiction, um, but but as I mentioned, you know, um, loosening Act 250 in communities like Hardwick or Barton or um, Island Pond, places that historically have never really seen, you know, broad investment. I think there still remains to be uh, questions of whether that investment would happen and whether that development would happen even with, you know, Act 250 exemptions because the nature of where jobs and money and where people live in the state. Um, but that's ultimately what, what the governor would, would like to see. Well, uh, certainly one we'll be following closely for sure. Uh, housing is a very big issue down at this corner of the state, as I'm sure it is across the entire state, but uh, uh, one that's been very frustrating for many people, I know. But uh, let's let's hop over to the education finance side of uh, things here, Rob. Uh, you know, during March town meeting, you know, what nearly one third of all proposed school budgets went down to defeat, and I think there have been a couple of revotes since then, and a few of them have gone down to a, a second defeat. Uh, and and it seems like uh, a lot of the issue is around the fifteen percent or so likelihood uh, in property tax increases that have uh, got people concerned. Um, so there have been uh, a couple of proposals that had to, uh, I guess, buy that down, or at least one that. I heard of last week was uh, Tax Commissioner Craig Bolio, uh, I guess, floating an idea to, to borrow some money from the future, but it didn't seem to get a whole lot of traction. Indeed, the Treasury Secretary Pichek kind of uh, poured cold water on it, too, uh, saying that it would uh, harm the state's credit rating, I guess. Uh, but what are what are some of the ideas going on uh, up in Montpelier about how they are going to, you know, uh, soften the impact of, uh, of this uh, proposed uh, you know, likely property tax increase. Yeah, I mean, this has been the biggest issue of the legislative session and the House Education and the House Ways and Means Committee have been putting, I mean, hundreds of hours into this, you know, hearing from people all across the state. This has been such a tricky subject just because of how complex it is. There's been a number of things that they did earlier this session. Um, H850 allowed uh, districts to push back their school budget votes to try to trim some of the, the, the spending. So they were able to, you know, statewide get the total overall education spending from about 240 million down to about 190 million. So that helped bring the homestead property tax rate um, down to about a 15% increase on average is, is what you'll see. Um, but that's in conjunction, of course, they're also raising um, new taxes on short-term rentals like, like Airbnbs um, and, and a few others. And so there's, but I guess the, the, the big picture is really there's not much that lawmakers can do this year specifically to try to buy down that rate. Um, as I mentioned, 15% on average for, for homeowners. Uh, it's going to be about 18.5% for um, non-homestead property taxes like uh, second homes and commercial properties, rentals, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, there's work that's been going on short term this year. But last week, um, you know, there was a, a 
uh, press conference at the state house where they announced essentially um, they will be putting this to a legislative study. They're going to be coming up with a a blue ribbon task force type of of uh, committee where they'll be looking into what is the next iteration of our statewide education funding formula going to look like? As we know, after um, the the Brigham decision in the uh, 90s and uh, the, by the Supreme Court, it said that you know all students in Vermont have to have an equal and equitable education, and so that has led to the statewide education fund, where you uh, where local voters vote on their school budgets, which are drafted at the the local level. But some critics have said that that's really led to uh, or has incentivized um, spending. And certainly coming out of the pandemic, there's a lot of needs within schools, you know, clothing, food, um, education, mental health. You know, schools are, you know, superintendents tell lawmakers that, you know, schools are increasingly becoming a, a, a catch-all or a, a social safety net, um, you know, dealing with problems at home and in the broader community. And that's led to, you know, education spending really ballooning. So there's some of those tax, um, you know, measures that they're, they're taking this year to buy it down a little bit. Um, but there's also longer term things that they're going to be doing. As I mentioned, that study but they're also advancing other bills like a statewide school construction task force. They're going to be rebooting that so the state will take more of an active role in um, you know, assisting with, with school construction and helping out local districts. But that, the, that work is still a few years away. Um, so I guess to, to answer your, your question, um, you know, as you mentioned, lawmakers are, are not going to be moving forward with the, the proposal from the governor and the um, treasurer or from uh, tax commissioner Craig Bolio. So it, it is going to be a, a challenging year um, this year and, and likely next year for, for property taxes too. Um, and what about this proposal for like a wealth tax? I I, I, I think that was, that, that had a connection in with this too, because that was a uh, increase the, uh, the tax rate for the wealthiest Vermonters to help uh, bring in more money into the budget. I assume that some of that would find its way to the education fund and then help, uh, so from the property tax increases. Yeah, so the the um, the wealth tax that was being floated by the Ways and Means Committee, that was actually going to go toward uh, a couple of other um, uh, initiatives to fund the you know judiciary, fund affordable housing over the next 10 years, put some money toward the general assistance hotel motel program. Um, that wealth tax was part of a broader tax package that was going to raise somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 100, um, $125 million. And it also included, um, you know, as I mentioned, that new um, tax bracket for people making over $500,000. There was the property transfer tax and a new corporate income tax as well. That was passed by the House of Representatives. Um, the Senate just this past week, uh, they moved forward with their own tax proposals, um, you know, a tax on, on streaming software and also on uh, broker agents, a fee that would raise about $20 million. So the House and Senate, in terms of raising revenue uh, for, for some of these programs, uh, they're moving in, in different directions. Uh, we'll have to see again, as you mentioned, you know, will they be able to iron out their differences? Um, you know, the, some of those that uh, those discussions for how we fund initiatives in the budget, you know, th those will uh, have to be ironed out. But in terms of the property tax and, you know, the wealth tax, to answer your original question, um, some of those those new taxes going to buy down the uh, education fund, um, those were not specifically going toward that. The, it was really just the attacks on, on short-term rentals as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of moving pieces with it, for sure. Really? Uh, I mean, and one other area that uh, I've, I've been hearing some discussion about is whether or not uh, it's time to revisit the whole closing of small schools again, uh, consolidating, uh, well, like we saw in Act 46 back in 2015 or, or so, uh, small schools uh, were just deemed to be some of them anyway too expensive to run, and they were been somewhat consolidated. That caused caused a lot of pushback from some other communities that were affected by that, uh, seeing those small schools as being sort of centerpieces of their community and and all of that. Um, is there any sense that there is a, a willpower on the part of the legislature or or the governor or wherever to kind of have another look at that and say, well, these 10 or 12 little schools here really could be consolidated into a larger one and we could save some money that way. 
Yeah, and and that's a great question, and it is that is I think one of the 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 policy levers that state lawmakers and the governor and the executive branch are both looking to to say should the state be taking more of an active role in you know how schools are funded and which schools receive what type of funding later down the line and what does that mean for the physical footprint of schools? I don't think anybody has that answer yet, but people are saying that needs to be on the table in terms of um, you know because it's it's not just your facility but it's also your staff within those facilities. If you have a small rural school, you're paying for a teacher and or or two or maybe three, sometimes more. And uh, we have one of the lowest student to staff ratios in the country, uh, meaning that it's, it's very expensive. Um, so it's it's the infrastructure, it's the physical space, but it's also the individuals that that um, that are are teaching and delivering those services and paying for pensions and health care and et cetera for those teachers too. And, you know, as I mentioned, there's that school construction aid bill that is moving forward. And there this session, there's been sort of a chatter about newer and fewer, right? So looking to invest in our schools, make them, you know, meet the needs of the 21st century and what learning looks like in the classroom, uh, but also trying to uh, yeah, either consolidate or close or just reimagine what our school districts should look like. We're even seeing that bubble up in the Montpelier Roxbury School District. Um, just you know, just the other day, um, Roxbury, the town of Roxbury, is is suing um, the school board, alleging that there was a a vote to close uh, the Roxbury school that was taken improperly. And I think that really gets at the heart of you know why this is going to be such a, a challenging and and really painful. Um, discussion over the next few years, because we know this is, uh, you know, in, in some cases, delivering education in a rural state with a declining demographic is expensive. And um, it, but at the same time, these schools play a huge role in, in the community, not just for the educational or social, um, uh, you know, emotional needs of, of kids and the developmental side of things, but for your community as well. I mean, schools are a community gathering spot for your select board or local classes for seniors or, um, you know, your community meal, you town meeting day, you name it. So th these are very, very challenging discussions that um, certainly, as I mentioned, that that blue ribbon task force will be looking into. Um, but to answer your question, yes, that that is definitely on the table as as one possibility. Um, but what exactly that that looks like and who is responsible, as we know, these are, are you know, school budget decisions are made at the local level uh and and so it's um there's still more work to be done on this so before we leave the education arena completely here move on to a couple of other things uh we also have a new education secretary um uh, i guess who's already started work but is going to be going for an appointment hearing later this week uh uh zoe saunders has a somewhat unusual background it seems to me she's coming from florida she's She's never been a classroom teacher or a principal or a school superintendent. Her background is uh, largely in the charter school area. And of course, there are no charter schools in Vermont. So it sounds like uh, she's uh, had a little bit of a <laughs> less, le less than overwhelming reception. Uh, what is your sense of uh, what you're hearing from the lawmakers in the state house uh, about this? Is, is it going to be a thing? Well, you know, uh, this is the governor's appointee. It's very hard to kind of say no to. Uh, an appointee uh, and we'll just see what happens or, or I mean the other right part of that is the fact it's taken so long for them to appoint someone Dan French uh, left over a year ago and uh, even particularly given all the issues in education right now it, it seems like an incredibly long time to be kind of without a permanent education secretary yeah, there there has been a lot of criticism about you know having the the state's top you know one of the biggest cabinet roles uh, having been vacant for, for that long. There's been a, a lot of criticism that's been been lobbed toward the administration. But yeah, to, to your point, Zoe Saunders, she comes to Vermont from Florida. She's worked um, for Broward County Schools, which is the sixth largest school district in the country, um, three times the size of all of Vermont's student body combined. So, I mean, it's, it's really um, just in terms of the scale and the issues that that she's had to deal with on, um, you know, uh, at, in Florida, it's definitely a, a lot different. You are correct. You know, she comes to uh, Vermont 
um, from 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 Florida and with a background in charter schools, which we do not have. And I think, you know, that has really drawn the, the skepticism. I think, you know, there's been a lot in the education, a lot of folks in the education community um, that have really kind of pushed back on on her or raised, you know, concerns about, you know, her, is she the right fit? I don't think anybody's really questioning her qualifications or her, you know, is she a good person or does she have the right intentions or not? But whether like what her educational philosophy, um, you know, whether that uh, whether that really jives with with Vermont and, you know, our values of, of local control and public education. And so, you know, when I've spoken with senators about this, there were a few that were were, were skeptical uh, at, at first or had concerns, but they said that they were going to reserve really any judgment until they could meet with her one on one until they could also, um, you know, see her in these hearings as well, which, as you mentioned, are going to be kicking off this week. Um, and, and I think part of, you know, the, the Scott administration has has seen that concern as well. Um, She's, you know, formulating a, a listening tour statewide in different school districts. You know, she's been um, chatting with us at Channel 3. She was on Vermont Public Radio. She's spoken with uh, a number of media outlets. And so I think, you know, from the, the governor's perspective, he wants Vermonters to get to know Zoe Saunders and just, you know, understand who she is, what her values are, uh, and, and you know, who she is as, as a person. Uh, you know, as you point out, um, some there has been some criticism that she hasn't served in a educational role um, as a principal or a, a teacher. But, you know, when I spoke with her last week, she said that the role that she played both within Broward County Schools and at Charter Schools USA, uh, she said really was aimed at assisting and helping local districts and local educators with their own policy decisions, um, you know, on the ground. And so she, she said that's why she feels like she's the right fit. Um, but really, you know, her main message is that, you know, any big change in the le in, in how we do business here in Vermont, education wise, how we fund schools, what our policies should look like in the school within the school walls, those decisions need to be made with everybody at the table. So I think, you know, she's really um, coming to this from a right now from a position of just listening and trying to understand what are the issues that are facing Vermont. Uh, you know, how do these systems work and and what what is the best way forward? Well, it'll be certainly interesting to see how, how this one plays out for sure. Uh, uh, I, I, a couple of other things I just wanted to kind of uh, touch upon uh, public safety and criminal justice reform initiatives uh, also been kind of uh, uh, on the table in, in front of the legislature as well and, and how to fund them, of course. Uh, so so what's going on here? Can you bring us up to speed on those areas? Yeah, so there's really been two public safety initiatives that have happened. One has been in the Senate, the other in the House. The Senate has been moving forward with a bill, S-58, I believe it is, and it would essentially pause the Raise the Age initiative. That's the one that brings young offenders um, into the, the uh, family court system as opposed to trying 19 or 20-year-olds in uh, adult court. Um they're putting the pause on those ref those criminal justice reforms once again um, because DCF and, and others say that they just can't keep up with the influx of, of people and the stress on the system. So on the Senate side, they're, they're pausing. On the House side, they're really looking at to, uh, addressing the court backlog. Since the pandemic, you know, there's been a, a delay in justice and people haven't been able to, to access the courts and um, you know, there've you know some critics have said that there's no no accountability within the criminal justice system, and that people are arrested, released on conditions, and they never make it back into courts. They don't show up for their dates, and you know some have said that this has led to some of the public safety challenges that we've seen in Vermont. So, as part of that tax package that we talked about earlier, that 125 million, um, there was about. Uh, about 24 25 million dollars that was put toward an expansion of the judiciary about 72 new positions judges states attorneys um, public defenders you name it to try to expedite justice to move cases quicker through through the system uh so that's sort of how the legislature has been approaching it um you know the governor uh, I don't think he's necessarily been opposed to these new positions, um, but he has been very cautious or very skeptical about creating these new positions, uh, not just as like a temporary, let's clear the court backlog and then eliminate them, but building into the new into the state budget 
this this um, you know expenditure year over year, building up the base of the budget. So that's I think where the, the governor's biggest concern. Um, again, but it's it's you know funded with these new tax increases. So that's I think for for lack of better words, that's kind of where we stand with the public safety and, and criminal justice. Certainly, it's one of the bigger issues that lawmakers felt like they had to address this legislative session. Interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if that was, uh, you know, kind of a, a, an outgrowth from the pandemic and, and uh, the delays in the system and the backlog that that caused uh, versus a crime uptick or something. I, 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 but I, uh, well, uh, another one to, to, to follow up. Sure. Now, another uh, area um, I know you've been following is uh, uh, health care investments, uh, expansion of Medicaid, uh, where the state's looking to go with the next iteration of health care reform. Because uh, there, there seems to be a lot of stress in the system at the moment. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, Copley Hospital in Morrisville, I guess, had to go before the state uh, bring down the care board to allow it to increase its budget uh, or its rates. Um, are a lot of the hospitals kind of struggling with those issues or is that just an isolated case there? Yeah, we, we saw this a few years ago with Springfield Hospital. They had really big budget budget challenges. Um, rural health care across the country is is struggling. So it's not just a Vermont problem, but like we talk about with education, delivering health care in a rural state is expensive and it's been really challenging. You know, we've seen double digit rate increases for health insurance premiums the past few years, plus hospital budgets are continuing to rise. Um, you know, some of these factors are, are within our control. Um, staffing and housing and child care and things that are placing those types of stresses on our ability to recruit um, health care professionals. But just medical inflation is also um, a, a really big you know, national challenge that we're seeing, too. Uh, so, you know, the, the legislature this session there, as you mentioned, moving forward with an expansion of Medicaid for, um, you know, pregnant women, elderly Vermonters, um, you know, teenagers, Dr. Dinosaur, really trying to get more people into the system and help with that affordability challenge. Um, but at the same time, not necessarily the legislature, but the Scott administration is moving forward with the next iteration of, of our uh, health care reform. It's called the AHEAD model, trying to, um, you know, change how we pay for, for health care and trying to incentivize more primary care and, and whatnot. So that's kind of where we stand. But you know, at the same time, as, as you mentioned with, with Copley, there is work that's, that's happening behind the scenes um, with trying to make our hospitals sustainable and trying to rethink what types of services should Vermont be, be offering. I mean, for a state of 620, 630,000 people, do we need 14 full service hospitals where UVM and uh, Central Vermont Medical Center and, and Porter have a huge, um, uh, have a, a the lion's share, if you will, of our patient population. So I think that work is continuing. We'll see some recommendation likely uh, next year on on the footprint of our hospitals and what types of services they should provide. But um, yeah, the, the healthcare um, you know conversation remains a very active one, uh, and and certainly it's playing into you know property tax increases for you know teacher healthcare. We're seeing that state employee healthcare. Um, it's it's healthcare is is one of those those strains that's really uh it it is taking a really big toll but there's no easy immediate answer as to, to how do we bring down the cost it really has been a busy session this year we want to cover holy it God. has um and we're not done yet uh, uh so before we have to run just real quick uh it's also an election year uh, yes. And after the, the legislature does finish up its business and uh, perhaps get, gets through a veto session, if that's what might happen, I it's hard to imagine they wouldn't have to get called back. But uh, I guess the big question is, uh, Governor Scott is, uh, is what his fourth term now. Uh, he'd be going if he wants a re-election. He'd be going for a fifth term. I think only Howard Dean and uh, Dick Snelling, I think, for the only two governors who ever got to five terms. Do we think he's uh, going to throw his head in the ring another time? You know, all indications that I'm hearing and seeing is that the governor is leaning toward yes. Um, you know, certainly he, he sees himself as the last line of defense, really, against, you know, Democratic lawmakers and what he views as overspending and overtaxing in Montpelier. He sees himself as the last line of defense for especially rural Vermonters as well. 
And what the governor this session, uh, he's really been using his his bully pulpit in a, a, a pretty big way to try to push back on on some of the, the spending, try to push back on some of the um, the direction of, of public policy making at the state house this year. And he's also been very vocal about, you know, going out and actively um, campaigning and trying to recruit candidates. That's certainly been a really big challenge for the GOP in recent years, not filling um, not contesting open seats, that is. But the governor, you know, through his point as well, um, you know, it's not just Republicans, he said he's looking for, but, you know, more fiscally moderate independents and even Democrats. Um, so, you know, the governor certainly has been taking a, a really active role uh, in that. So, you know, we, he hasn't officially announced and, and you know, we don't know exactly which way. You never know until you know, right? But um, he, you know, I think... There will be a decision that that will be made, and um, you know I don't think the, the governor thinks that his his work is done in Montpelier. And then, of course, the only other you know the, there's a lot of state house seats. Certainly, there could be some turnover in the Vermont Senate. Um, we could be looking at that, and that could really change the direction of policy making in the state house. The house is, leans a little bit more left, where the Senate has been a little more fiscally um, moderate, if you will. Um, depending on how much turnover, you know, we we could see a direction there. And then, of course, the other big uh, question is what happens with Senator Bernie Sanders and being at the top of the ticket? Will he, um, you know, will will he seek re-election? And if he does or or doesn't, well, how will that choice affect or or how will that decision affect um, other statewide office holders down ballot? Will people try to make a move for his spot? Uh, you know, will people from the state house try to move up? So there certainly could be a little bit of a shuffling that that happens depending on what happens with Governor Scott and Senator Sanders too. But again, um, a lot of people have really been nose to the grindstone in policy making. The education property tax issue has certainly taken up a lot of oxygen in the room. Um, but I expect that to be an issue on the campaign trail too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's say not. Well, Calvin, I think we could talk for another half an hour just about the politics of all of this, but I, I guess we're going to have to leave it there for today, unfortunately. But uh, really want to thank you again for making the time for this conversation. Most enjoyable. And uh, to all of you who haven't uh, watched Calvin on Vermont this week, uh, you need to start watching that. Must see TV. Just on last Friday, I think, if I recall correctly. And uh, anyway, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, Calvin. And uh, Thanks to all of you who've been with us. I hope you found our program interesting. We'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, take care.